technical algorithms, which we don't know really what it, how it, uh, it works, does it uh, minimize the slack? Does it maximize the slack? Um, and I think the answer is yes if there's only one non-zero slack. Um, and the, the reason why I know, I, I mean, I can say um, that for a fact is, is um, is is large scale method. I mean, if you are interested in large scale method, there is a help in my lab, or you can read anywhere else uh, about large scale method, large, large scale algorithm. But it basically tries to solve the primal problem and the dual problem simultaneously. Now, as we'll see in a second, is the optimal value for the um, primal problem, the optimal uh, the um, solution, and the optimal solution of the dual problem are connected to each other. And in fact, the um, minimum value of the, of the primal and the maximum value of the dual are equal to each other. So you can think of it as being like you're trying to solve the primal problem which is a minimization problem, so that would be kind of on top here. So you're trying to minimize that cost in the primal problem. At the same time, you're trying to maximize the cost in the dual problem. Theoretically, you know they're the same number. Okay, So I think the algorithm kind of stops when the, the residual, I mean, that's the whatever you, um, the difference you compute at every um, iteration becomes small enough, like, I don't know, Epsilon. Okay, so that would be the stopping criteria, but um, basically minimizing the uh, the uh, the uh, primal problem is is achieved at the same time as um, finding this values, the optimal values of the dual uh, of the dual variables, and the dual variables are exactly the shadow prices as we'll see in a second. Um, because, there, first of all, how many variables, the dual variables do we have? Exactly how many constraints we have in the initial problem? So that's, uh, we'll see in a second that, you know, y1 will correspond to the shadow price for the first constraint, y2 for the second constraint, and so forth. And if you remember, what we said the shadow price is basically, so basically the optimal y1 would correspond to the shadow price of the first constraint at uh, the optimal value, at the optimal vertex of the original problem. Right? Uh, same with y2 and y3. So, for, so, and of course, if if I have, uh, we had, let's see, we had a zero shadow price. No, excuse me. Yeah, we had a zero shadow price at a non-zero uh, slack, right? Where you have a non-zero slack, you have a zero shadow price, right? So where that happens, you have a zero in the y. So some of the y's have to be zero. Remember, that's a, that's the case in every linear programming problem. You set your non-basic variables to be zero. So. So I have a feeling that that, that actually is going to help um, maximize the slack. Okay, I mean I don't have a proof for you, but um. so so let's uh, just quickly see the relationship between the two. So um, there are two important two important facts about a primal and dual problem. LPP. Okay. And that is that if the first one is uh, called a weak duality, which simply says that um, if x and y are feasible, or basically in the feasible set for 
the primal that's in standard form and for the dual respectively then the objective function of the dual, the dual objective function is always less than the um, objective function of the primal. So that's why, you know, think of it as being, it's all, you know, it's, if, if there was a way to plot that objective function versus x's and objective fu function versus y's, the the values of the objective function um, in terms of x variable is always greater than the objective function in terms of y. And this is pretty much for any feasible things, which is which is kind of quite um, well, it's quite remarkable, um, and it has implications. In addition, <clears throat> if equality holds. That is, if for some feasible y for the dual and some feasible x for the primal, you have this uh, relation, then x is optimal for p and y is optimal for d, for the dual problem. So, in a way, this, I mean, this would be the first justification of looking at the dual problem of, a, of an LPP. So, it's very easy to see why. Well, what's the, 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 the um, the primal problem P in, in standard form. So let's first look at the inequality. So we have AX equals B, that means X is feasible and X positive, right? This is what it means X to be feasible. Y is feasible if Y times A equals C, but no restriction on Y, right? So this simply now you can go and say, well, YB is Y times A times X. These are metric, this is metric multiplication, so it can be, I'm sorry, um, I'm sorry, Y A less than or equal to C is the, is the dual problem, okay? So you can combine these two, and now you can replace Y times A with C and put in equality and use the fact that X is positive, so you, <clears throat> I guess the only confusing thing might, might be, how can I write <coughs> matrix less than a matrix? Well, these are not matrices. This is a row, and this is a row. And this inequality is component by component, component-wise. And that's why when you multiply basically a row that is less than another row, component by component, you multiply by the same vector which is positive, the inequality is preserved. Because it's term by term. So you basically see that Y, B, and C, X are always in this fashion. Now, <coughs> so it's really simple. Um, explanation. Of course, this assumes that you have a feasible solution for, for the primal and a feasible solution for the dual. Sometimes the feasible sets may be empty, right? So that in that, in that case, it doesn't apply. And we'll, we'll see what happens. But if, if you find, if you have a feasible set for x and a feasible, uh, for the primal and a feasible set for, non-empty feasible set for the dual, then this inequality holds for every x and y. So in particular, it says that the maximum 
of YB that is Y is feasible for the dual problem is what? is less than every C times X with X feasible for for all X feasible for P and why is that? so if you have a feasible for, for P, fix that fix that X and then all Y feasible for the dual will have Y times B less than that so the maximum of this or sometimes we call the supremum but we're talking about compact sets and you know supreme is achieved so the maximum of that <coughs> satisfies this and now you just take the minimum basically the minimum of CX of course with AX less equal to B X greater than B A0 so the minimum of dual problem of the, of, the, of, the, of the primal so basically that's the value of the objective in the the optimal objective in the primal is always greater than or is greater than the maximum in the dual So, from just this uh, like simple thing, you can draw the conclusion that if you minimize a LPP problem in standard form, and you maximize the dual problem of you know of the standard form, then you get that this is less than that. Okay. Well, the next step is to show that these are equal, actually. Oh, okay. But right now, it's just, just from that fact, it follows that one is less than the other. Less than or equal to than the other. Yeah. So the next thing is the strong duality, which says these, th these two things are equal when they're finite. Um, well, what if, they were, uh, what if they're not finite? For instance, if you, if you can minimize uh, LPP in standard form, I mean, if the minimum is, a, is negative infinity, then it would say a dual problem is infeasible. Because every time you have something that's feasible, you would have a value here that you would multiply by B. Right? If you, and the, uh, the other way around, um, I guess I, I, we didn't formally state that the dual problem of the dual is the primal problem. Um, you can see that very easily from the very first, you know, switching from uh, one type of inequality to the opposite type. We can actually see it from. Uh, the relation between the standard form and the dual you can now reverse this and show that the dual, the dual of this dual is actually the standard form but it's easiest to, to, to see it in when you do the, um, the canonical forms rather than the standard forms okay. so using that thing basically would say well it's the same thing if if you can maximize the dual, I mean, if the maximum of the dual is a plus infinity, then it means that the primal problem is infeasible. Okay? So there is a good, good uh, inequality here already. So, so, in, so if uh, the primal is has minimum equal minus infinity, it means that the dual is infeasible. Simply meaning that 
the feasible cell is empty. Also, if the dual has maximum equals plus infinity, it means that the primal is infeasible. <coughs> In fact, that, that would be actually a practical way to kind of see when a uh, LPP problem has a feasible side that's empty or not. Sometimes you have a bunch of inequalities and you don't know you don't know if that's a, a consistent set of inequalities that gives you a solution or not, right? Well, it would be enough to kind of formulate a dual problem and somehow through some um, arguments to conclude that that problem can go all the way to plus infinity. So you could look at the feasible region of, of the dual problem and say, I have a way to go to infinity. And that would automatically imply that the primal problem is infeasible. So that's useful, you know. Um, that's a practical way to kind of show a set of inequalities is, you know, doesn't have solution. <clears throat> um, but anyways, we're actually after something that's even more important, which is to say that the, those two values are actually equal when they're finite. Um, I think there was one, one, one additional, before we go to that strong statement, there was one additional which says, if, if there's a feasible x and a feasible y for the primal and dual respectively, for which this happened to, equal, to be equal to each other, then there, this is optimal for the primal and y is optimal for the dual. So why is that? It also follows from this inequality. Right? So in the special case that y be, I don't know, y star b equals cx star for some x star feasible for P and Y star feasible for D. Notice I barely spell feasible right, but that's because of the pen. Um, why, why is this kind of, if, if there is one that's equal to that, this basically means that the maximum equals this, right? And the minimum equals that. So it means that y bar is the minimum, maximum of yb. Well, let me, let me put it this way. It means that the maximum y star b, uh, yb, sorry. equals, for the dual problem, let's just write like this, equals y star b equals c x star equals the minimum for the primal problem of cx. So it means x star and y, y, y star are optimal. <coughs> it may not be the only one, but it's optimal for p, and y star is optimal for so again, the way I like to think of it is the primal, of course this is a bad picture, but basically says that the values of the primal are always above the values of the dual, and if they touch, then where they touch, you know, you have optimal for both. And <clears throat> The strong, that's the second one, strong duality, says that if uh, both P and D are feasible, uh, 
then the optimal then they are solvable simultaneously then they are solvable simultaneously and the maximum of the dual problem equals the minimum of the original one primal So, just kind of a sketch of the proof. <coughs> Normally, I mean, wherever you see this proof, I think that's um, it's not that it's sophisticated, but it takes it, it is a little bit lengthy. Um, I think the um, approach here is kind of <coughs> nice because it relies on the on, on the way it was set up previously as far as the um, simplex method is concerned. So, um, say if X is optimal for the primal, let's say that I have an optimal value for the primal and, you know, it's, say it's achieved through whatever, simplex method, but when we're at an optimal we have several of the components of that vector to be zero. That was that fact. You maximum is achieved at a, at a um, extreme point for that feasible set. So that extreme points are characterized by the non, you know, set of, of variables, n minus m of them at least, to be zero. So that's, those are the non-basic variables. And xb is the um, so, this kind of assumes that you reshuffle the variables, right? You put them on the first spot. Uh, B as the <coughs> M by M matrix, which corresponds to the uh, basic variables, and they're moved on the first spot, on the first M spots. Um, and the value of the X B, uh, the value of those basic variables at the vertex are given by solving um, BXB equals little b, right? So XB is B inverse B. Remember that? So that was, that was um, sort of an outcome of the simplex, of the way the simplex method was set up. Uh, moreover, it was C, so this is again reshuffling, so this means that the CX, which is CB, oh, I'm sorry, this should be uh, transpose, right? The X, the X is a column, the X was a column, so transpose. So when you multiply C times X, you get C, B, X, B. So you get C, B, B inverse, B. Now also as an optimal, there was that uh, R vector, which actually was the one at the bottom of the simplex tableau. So R at an optimal, optimum. Let's see, what was R? R was CN minus C, B b inverse n was positive. That meant that you couldn't decrease the objective any further because in any direction you go from that vertex you would actually increase 
the objective, right? So all the components are zero. So again, this means all components are, are positive, excuse me, uh, zero or positive. So they're not negative. All right, so uh, denote y to be c, b, b inverse. This is a row vector. So these are m components, so that's exactly the uh, number of constraints. Okay, so you, it's not quite, you know, quite obvious. Um, I don't think the original proof of the duality theorem was 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 this straightforward, but I think this this computation just shows the essence of that. And I mean, we're not just trying to um, kind of reinvent the wheel, but just kind of follow the um, um, <clears throat> kind of synthesize the uh, the the out the outcome. I mean the outcome of this duality theorem, which is, says, pick this vector. I mean, this vector comes in in this expression, right? So CB is a row, and B inverse is a, is a square matrix. So it's going to be a row, M, M, M dimensional row vector. M components. Right? And the claim is that this particular vector is the optimal for the dual problem. All you have to do to say, uh, to, to say that it's optimal is to use that weak duality and, and compute the well, first y is uh, feasible for the dual. Now, feasible for the dual means you simply compute y times a, so y to the left of a, which it would be c b b inverse b n, and show that this is less than or equal than c. Okay, so this is c b times b inverse b and c b b inverse n and this is c b and c b b inverse b is less than or equal than c n so that's the arg positive so c n is greater than that second component so this is less than or equal than c n and this is just c so y a is less than or equal than c and that's feasible for the dual. So it's admissible for the dual problem. Next, YB is we want to show that actually is equal to C times X. And that's, um, let's see, CB, B inverse little b, but B inverse little b is xb and this is cx so yb equals cx that's it means that by the weak duality it says that those two sets touch I mean at the simultaneous simultaneously meaning that yb and y excuse me it means that y is optimal for X, for uh, the dual problem by the week, by the by the result above, okay, so it means that at least as far as the values of the objective on each problem, those two match, and also in addition there is this important and. It's important way of how to get the inverse, I mean, how to get the, the optimal solution for the dual problem. It's enough to know 
what the basic variables are in the op on the uh, optimal solution for the primal problem. Look at that matrix B. Take the inverse and multiply it to the right with the row corresponding to those coefficients in the objective function, or in the original problem. Okay, so let's let's do an example. Um, I think I'd like to. Well, I think I really want to leave the problem six for the homework for you. Um, Okay, let's 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 look at this one. Um, consider minimizing three x one plus four x two plus five x three subject to x one plus two x two plus three x three greater than or equal than five two x one plus two x two plus x3 greater than or equal to 6, and all x's are positive or 0. So we're staying away from the, we're in the first octant, but we're staying away from the origin. So it's a, the simplex is unbounded, right? Because the inequalities are greater than or equal to, and that's why minimizing makes sense. We're trying to minimize Okay, so um, the dual problem says what? Five y one plus six y two. Maximize this subject to. Let's see y1 plus 2y2 less than or equal than 3, 2y1 plus 2y2 less than or equal than 4, 3y1 plus y2 less than or equal than 5, and y1, y2, y positive. Okay. You would You would get the same formulation if you were to go through the standard formulation first of the primal problem. If you set slack variables and do all that, right? Well, <clears throat> how do you solve this? Well, it's two-dimensional. You could use actually a kind of a graphical um, approach, right? I mean, I'm not going to get the numbers, uh, the exact numbers, but you can see that um, all these lines, so the feasible, let's plot the feasible region for the dual problem. It's going to be in the first quadrant, it's going to be bounded by three lines. Uh, this line has slope negative one, this line has, this, this line has slope negative three, 
and this line has slope negative a half. So it's kind of one of one is the least, right? Then it's steeper, and probably it's even steeper. So so it looks like. You have this many vertices, right? And that's not always true. I mean, one of the lines may not intersect the other two. So I, I'm kind of just shooting in the dark here without uh, looking at the numbers. Okay. The next thing is to say, look at the objective function and figure out the uh, slope of that, which is negative five sixths, right? So the objective function has slope negative five six, and what were the other ones we said? Negative a half, negative one, negative three. So this belongs to negative one and negative one half, right? So the slope is between this, these two curves, these two lines, right? So it means that the vertex is going to be exactly where these two lines intersect. So you just have to solve these two. I mean, with equalities, you have to solve and find the vertex. And you would find the values for y1 and y2. Um, Let's see, can we find that quickly? Looks like where one is one and y two is one, right? So the maximum occurs maximum is five times one plus six times one, so that's eleven and achieved at y1 star y2 star equals 1 and 1. The question is how do you go back to the x variables, right? Well the graphical method doesn't really help you much. Um, it would help you if you Um, would consider the following. Basically, if you'd go from this, let's say this is the vertex, and change the problem to relax, well, x1, x2, and x3 would be the shadow prices of those three inequalities, right? So you'd have for x1, what you'd have to do is you'd have to relax the first one, change that from 3 to, say, 4, the first inequality. Okay? And redo this thing and find what the, uh, uh, what the um, objective is. The difference in the objectives would be x1. Okay? It is... Um, let's see. So if I change it with, let, let's just do that with with, uh, with one of them. So it would be, so to find x1 star is that solve, say, max, max 5x, 5x1 plus 6y2 subject to x1 plus 3x2 less than 4. Is it 3? No. 2. Hmm? When you're subject to. Wise. Thank you. <coughs> I'm sorry. I need to scroll back and up and forward.
Unless you tell me what's the third one. Okay, so the only difference here is that we've changed this one by one. Now there is a danger that when you change it by one, you're actually making making it such a dramatic change that the um, vertex occurs on a different at a different point. Okay, but uh, let's let's uh, let's see. So I, w I wouldn't actually do this. Do it this way. Um, but let's see if we just change it by say one. Well, let's let's just just change it by 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 some some small some small uh, number here three plus epsilon, okay. We just perturb it by a little bit. Let's see how is the the objective changing. Well, you have to solve y one plus two y two equals three plus epsilon, and two y one plus two y two equals four, because it would be the same two equalities that are binding, the constraints that are binding. So you'd, you'd get that y1 equals if you subtract this minus that, it would be 1 minus epsilon, right? And y2 would be uh, 2 minus y1, so it would be 2 minus 1 minus epsilon, 1 plus epsilon, right? So the objective would be would be 5, 1 minus epsilon plus 6, 1 plus epsilon. So it would be 11 plus epsilon. Yeah? So what basically this says, it means that the x1 star has to be 1. Because, OK, so basically that's the new objective. Let's call it m maximum of epsilon. So it would be the change in m over the change in epsilon. That's the shadow price, and that's the derivative is 1, OK? okay. Now, you would have to do this for every, 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 every um, uh, change in constraints, OK? Now, I have actually um, Same for x2 star and x3 star. OK. Now, what actually t turns out is, so the shadow price is basically the change Corresponding to to one constraint, let's say um, that a x the ith component is b i. Okay, i equals one to m. So corresponding to one line, one of the constraints. Okay, we're talking about the standard form is uh, the difference in optimal um, values of the objective function. So let's call it objective by M.
b i plus epsilon minus m of b i. So it's, I'm sorry, 1 over epsilon. Well, let's put it equal to 1 here. It doesn't matter. So let's 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 um, uh, see why why is this? Well, that's the definition of the of the shadow price. First of all, definition of the shadow price is you change the constraint by not necessarily one unit, but by by a, by a, a certain amount of unit, and then you divide by the change you've made. So if you make the change by one, okay, then the difference will basically correspond to the derivative of this objective, the maximum objective, or the, min, uh, the, the optimal objective function. Okay, so this is equal to the derivative delta m over delta b. Okay. Now it turns out that since m, so this optimal objective is going to be a, f a linear function of b. Okay. Why is it a linear function of b? I mean, from the duality theorem, you can already see that whatever the maximum objective is for the primal problem, the minimum objective for the primal problem is going to be the maximum of the dual problem. Okay. And the dual problem is. So for the dual problem, m of b is simply the product between the optimal y, y star, let's put it y star, because that's a fixed y, and b. b is the right-hand side of the constraints. Okay. So it's a linear function. So basically, this this change in m over change in b is really the derivative, and right for a linear function, that's what you do. I should I should call it bi here. Right. Well, what's <coughs> what's the dual problem here? What's the derivative partial derivative of m with respect to the dual problem with respect to bi? It's going to be exactly y i star, right? So it means that the dual variable is identical to the shadow price of the height constraint in the original problem, in the primal problem. Okay. Now the only difference is so. Here I consider one, but if it's not one, if you, for instance, cannot change that constraint by so much, but you can change it by just a little bit so you don't change the geometry of the feasible set, then it would be an epsilon here, and then of course you would divide by epsilon to get the actual, the, you know, the relative change. And it would be still uh, the, the partial derivative, right? So you don't have to make such a dramatic change if you cannot make the dramatic change. That's why. That's how I got that. Um, you know, I wasn't sure I can make it with with epsilon unless you, with one, I just put an epsilon here. And what I got is I got the new objective function when I make a change by an epsilon to be. 11 plus a little bit of plus an epsilon. Now, if you do it for, for x2, you know, it's, it's not clear unless you do the computation what is the, um, the coefficient of epsilon that you get there. Right? It would be 2. Yeah. So forth. So, and, and the other thing that I should be said here is that here we had the sys, the dual actually, that we solved and we're and here we computed the shadow prices of the dual 
And since the dual of the dual is the primal, that's how we conclude that the x for the primal problem, the optimal x for the, optimal for the primal problem, is the shadow price of the dual. Right? So the so you know again just to uh, clarify here is that so the shadow price for the primal equals the optimal solution of the dual and the shadow price for the dual is the optimal solution for the primal. Okay. How can you... Um, so I said that those are kind of ad hoc methods that you can do to, you know, either from the graphical method or from, um, you know, whatever. But certainly the simplex tableau is, is the best way to do it. So let's, let's look at the simplex tableau to make the connection with the... Um, between the dual, the primal and the dual. So in the simplex tableau, let's look at um, all right, so let's let's um, what was the minimization? three x one plus four x two plus five x three subject to x1 plus 2x2 plus 3x3 at least 5 and 2x1 plus 2x2 plus x3 at least 6 and all, all x's are positive right then the simplex tableau would look like the following So it's going to be um, negative one, negative one, negative three, one zero, and negative five. So I'd like to make this less than or equal to, and get the slag variable to be positive, right? So that's u one, u two. This is x one, x two, x three. Uh, the next one would be negative 2, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, negative 6, <coughs> and this would be 3, 4, and 5. 0, 0, and 0, right? Well, actually, let me, let me, um, yeah. Is that right? Is this with positive or negative? It's positive, right? Yeah. Okay, so what do we do now? 
if we were to solve this using the so we could do two two different ways one it would be to pursue this and do the simplex change the, the tableau in you know using the original um, primal problem of course you'd have to figure out what the basic variables are and there cannot be these two why why not you have this negative one right right so so it would not be this ones so you'd have to kind of either start with this and then pursue you know figure out where you have well take the inverse sort of I mean doing raw operations until this become one zero 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 and zero 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 one right or as I said last time I think probably the easiest would be kind of take this and that because then you would have x1 equals 3 and negative 3 no that's not good so yeah the first and hmm? it's a tough one right to figure out but probably just take the first two and do uh, well okay this and this is the easiest right this would be 6, x3 is 6, and then you have negative 18 to get negative 5, you have to add, so it would be positive. So these two are the positive ones. Okay? And you continue until, you know, you drop, <laughs> I guess, or you use some sort of a primal, you know, solve the primal problem. Or you could say, let's do the dual problem. Well, amazingly, is the same simplex tableau you can use. Okay, because in the dual problem, let's look at the dual problem here. And I don't want to, um, I'm sorry that I have to scroll this since I wrote it here. In the dual problem, take a look. Um, the rows really be the columns of that simplex tableau, right? So it's pretty much that simplex tableau would be. Let me see. Well, not not really, because you'd have the, the you'd have the sim the slack variables. You'd have some slack, so additional slack variables. But this values would be on the. You know, they were on the on the bottom. Now they're on on the um, on the side. And these things would be on the bottom and on the side. So, um, so the simplex, so the tableau for the dual looks just looks like like the following. So you have. Let's see, can somebody help me out? Negative? No, it would be 1. Two. I want to scroll again. One, two, and yeah, one, two, and no, I'm sorry. One two 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 three. Okay, one two and a slack, right? One two one zero zero. Zero one zero. That's it. And then this would be the three. Zero zero zero. zero. Hold on a second. So I don't have the last zero here. Okay, let me let me uh, take a look here. No, we have. I have three, so so I was to, I was in a hurry to put this, but this is not. Yep. Mm -hmm. Zero zero one. Okay. Zero zero one. Okay. And this is 
5, 6. Well, it should be negative 5, negative 6, because it's maximizing. In the simplex, we put minimizing the standard form, right? 0, 0, 0. And what else? 3, 4, 5. Okay, so just look at the simplex of the dual, the dual method, and we're kind of close to the finish here. So what you do here is you, um, if you imagine pursuing the, the simplex method for the dual, then it would be to take the most negative, well, first of all, you figure out the uh, basic variables, and these are the slack for the dual are the basic variables, right? So then you would start with the most negative here, negative 6. You would look at the ratio. Three over two. Uh, four over two, five over one, right? You look at the least positive. So this is one, right? And this was the pivot, right? And then you, you make this column to be uh, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, right? And the one that is going to change is going to be this one, right? Okay, well, if you do these operations, you can see that it's the same same thing as doing it up there by picking the most negative in the on the rows basically in that right hand side of the original tableau and then doing the ratios between the indicator row and the you know the pivot row that you find, right? So it's going to be 3 over negative 2, 4 over negative 2, 5 over negative 1, and of course taking the greatest negative, I mean, the minus, this will be the minus these ratios. So it's the same as picking this as the pivot, right? When we perform raw operations on this, or perform raw operations on that, in the end you're going to end up with similar, again, the same type of relationship between the two tableaus. Okay? And um, let me just say, after one iteration, It would be like this. It would be the simplex tableau would be zero, negative one, negative five halves, one, negative one half, negative two, one and zero. I just put this first row, first column. One, one, one half, seven halves, uh, zero, zero, negative a half, and three halves negative 9 and 3 so I just fill it out like <clears throat> hmm? this is this is this is the once we do the pivot on this one okay so you do the pivot on this one on the original tableau so it's it's not that you do um, you don't you don't do it on the dual, but you do it on the original tableau. Um, and if you if you were to do it on the dual, it would be actually be giving you kind of a, a, a 
similar tableau as, as this one. And let me just do the optimal tableau. After you do one more, um, it's going to be like this, 0, 1, 5 halves, negative 1, 1 half, 2, and 1, and 11. 1, 0, negative 2, 1, negative 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1. So I believe, let's see, what's the difference between this and that? That's the same. But now, this entered the picture, and that left the picture, right? So there was basically... Yeah, I think there are several steps, because you have to first find the basic variables for here, and then get to here. Okay? But this is the optimal tableau for the original uh, problem. And how can we read... So let's see. So the uh, primal, optimal uh, solution is x equals 1, 2, and 0. So why is that? Well, you know, you can see x1 is 1, x2 is, zero, x, x2 is 2, and x3 is non-basic. Okay? And the uh, dual optimal solution is y star equals 1 and 1, which was what we figured out uh, above. And this is in the common optimal value is, is 11. Okay, and the dual, let's see, dual, remember in the, in the tableau for the dual, where do you read the dual, uh, the values of the dual? You should have two values. They should be here, right? Isn't this how you, I mean, in a, in a normal tableau, this is how you read the, some of that are, I mean, you're going to have five, five values y1, y2, and three slacks, right? No, I'm looking, what am I looking at? Two y's and three, three, three inequalities, right? Three y's and three inequalities. So where do we read those values again for y? I think they should be they should be here. Huh? No, but in the end, like when we when we transform this after several iterations, the, the initial tableau would have the values here for y one one y two, and the others are set to be zero. You know, so they're going to be on this row. Well, in the original tableau, therefore, they're going to be on the bottom. And that's where you read the one and one from. Okay. So in the basically the initial tableau for the primal problem, when you kind of every time you compute the new vertex, you're computing the shadow prices at the same time, right? And and um, Every, so every, every tableau that you compute for the primal problem computes automatically also the shadow prices. Right? So that's why when you get to the optimal tableau, you can get 
the same time the, uh, the optimal values for x as well as the optimal values for y. Okay? And uh, remember we computed x1 to be 1 through that ad hoc method. So you can see x, x2 would be 2 and x3 would be 0, meaning that um, the shadow price for the dual problem was 0, meaning that this was a non-binding constraint. So you could, you could relax that and you could still get the same uh, value of the objective. Um, I'm sorry I'm running out of time. There's one problem on integer programming which I think it's uh, let's just drop that from the homework uh, number 11 since we didn't do that. Um, and also I have a handout which I also posted on the website so if you don't have time to stay now you just print it from the website. Um, which talks about the shadow price being the same as that derivative, um, not necessarily for linear objectives, but pretty much for any Lagrange multi where Lagrange multipliers, um, um, let's do this, wherever Lagrange multiplier method applies. So you have a constraint given by some function g and an objective given by some function f. Lagrange multiplier is what? says the gradient of f and the gradient of g have to be parallel and so one has to be a multiple of the other that value is exactly the same as the shadow price why is this relevant in our situation well, in our situation our f and our g are both uh, linear functions so gradients are just those coefficients Okay. And because of that, you can actually, that, that what I wrote there is a little bit more, I mean, it's an overkill for the linear case because you don't have partial derivatives. Partial derivatives are just the coefficients. And that's another way to see that um, the shadow price equals the dual, I mean, the, the values, the, the dual variables at the optimal point. Okay? All right. So.